Thank you, Church, for praying for me. <clears throat> In fact, I've got my wife. Uh, you know, she stopped nagging me for some time now. But my headache seemingly <laughs> continues to do that. But now that you guys have prayed, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, it's not going to last for long and yes. I'll be fine. Amen. I'm depending and trusting in the Lord. Uh, hmm. yeah. Trusting in the Lord to uh, minister, help, and uh, uh, me to communicate what the Lord has laid in my heart for all of you this morning. We guys have come back from a two and a half day retreat uh, a couple seminar and uh, we missed those who couldn't come uh, but we had a great time we had a great time and uh, uh, we, we could uh, uh, hear uh, and see uh, you know, lives being touched and some decisions being taken and uh, hoping that the Holy Spirit will help people to work with the Word of God and they'll be able to uh, uh, see the marriage in the fullness. This is not a big cook. Okay, so I continue to speak on family because I think family is important. Okay, and I see more people here than those who were there with us this weekend. So some of you who've been there, there may be a repeat a few things, but I'm sure you know the word will further work in your hearts, and it will bring about the due deliverance. I hope everybody here uh, knows this fact that family is God's design. Yes? yes, it is God's design, an amazing plan of God, a purpose of God for a greater purpose and for the fulfillment of his mission and his vision. You know, that is the primary objective. Right in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, we see God making man and woman and we see he bringing them together. He looks at the man and says it is not good for him. To be alone. He created everything beautifully. Everything he looked at and he said, this is awesome. You see, there's no great, uh, greater creative guy on earth than God himself. And for him to self-certify his own creation can give you an idea as to what would have been the sense of fulfillment that he would have had after creating. And then towards the end, he's creating man. And this time it's a very unique creation. He is creating him not just like any other creation, but very differently. But he looks at him and he says, this is not good. This is not good. Not good for what? For him to be alone. It is not good for him to be alone. And so he creates a woman for him. Hallelujah. Praise God for God's plan and purposes, isn't it? Otherwise, this life, this world would have been a boring place. Yes. With no ladies around, no <laughs> girls around. It would, have been a, it would have been a very boring face, looking all the time into Hudovi's face and <laughs> Vijay's face. It would have been ridiculously boring. But praise God. God saw that it was not good for man to be left alone. So therefore... He comes out with a great strategy. Now look at the beauty of this creation. He created everything and he, we see that none of them were created in his image and in his likeness. It was only man and woman who were created in his image and in his likeness. Okay? This is in itself a huge positioning and a privilege for mankind. His own image his own likeness, he created us. Godhead, we read Bible, we read Bible, we know the God that we serve is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I, and I look at it, and when I see them, I see a family there. A family creates a family. Bible says, let us create man in our image and our likeness. It doesn't say, let me create man in my own image and my likeness. He says, let us create man in our image and our likeness. So a family creating a family. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Awesome. 
And for what? He created everything beautifully and he entrusts this family on earth to replenish it, manage it, take it to the next level. Ah, wow. Who do you think you can entrust your work to? You, after building this ministry, this church, who would you entrust it to? Would you entrust it to anybody? Would I entrust my business to anybody? Who would you put it in the hands of? Somebody I know for sure or I believe in that they will take it to the next level. I don't want anybody who takes over my business, whether it's my children or anybody that I hire, to maintain status quo. I would want them to take it to the next level. Wow. And if I want that to happen, I'd rather invest in the guy that I am preparing, isn't it? So look at what God was doing. He was bringing this man and woman together beautifully and he was interesting them and telling them to take it to the next level. Wow. Wow. You, you think we have taken it to the next level? We have. We have. We have taken it to the next level. If Adam wanted to fly at that time from Eden to visit New Delhi, he couldn't have done that. So there are a lot of things around us which tells us that we have done a good job. When you have everything gloomy around you, remind yourself that there are a lot of good things that have happened around you. Okay? So a family creates a family beautifully for a greater purpose. People think, you know, you are 25, 26, already, you know, by the time you are 27, 28, this fellow poor guy, I've been asking him, when are you getting married? When are you getting married? When? Yeah, he must be getting bugged with me. This is, especially in India, everybody is interested in everybody's life. When are you getting married? Why are you not getting married? Should I look for a boy? Should I look for a girl? Ah! Marvin is already feeling the pressure. <laughs> He's just 23. So, you know, marriage is something which is very beautifully ordained by God. And God brings a man and a woman together to form a family beautifully to fulfill his plan and his purpose and to take his work forward. And he entrusts it to man so that he can do what nobody else can do. What do you see in the Godhead? What do you see in the Godhead? Between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, what do you see? Tell me a few things that you see. Do you see oneness? Yes. yes. Do you see harmony? Yes. What else do you see? Please tell me. You see community? Okay, awesome. What else do you see? You see love? Wow, you see love. Yes, what else do you see? Please go ahead, tell me. I need to know that if you have anything more than what I have written down. Submission in, in the Godhead. Wow, awesome. Yes, it is there. What else? Obedience? Okay, awesome. Wonderful. What else? Holiness. Holiness. Awesome. What else? Go ahead. Order. Awesome. What else? Huh? Counsel. Yes, what else? Acknowledgement of each other, recognizing each other, what else? Name it, you keep thinking, I'll tell you, you'll take, need a lot of time to understand this magnanimity of the relationship, the character, the quality that was there in Godhead. Yes, isn't it, Anas? Was there transparency there? Yes. Absolute transparency. Son says, I won't do anything except for what I see my father doing. Wow. Transparent life. Order. Submission, love, do you see respect? Yes. Respect, everything. Yes. Single mission, mission oriented. They were not going to through four directions. Sing. Unity. Unity. This is the exact image in which he made us. And he knew on our own, maybe it would be very challenging for us to meet. Therefore, he gets a suitable helper meet. 
Now the helper word in India, especially, is truck wala has a helper. The you know the 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 guy who picks the tool and gives it to him, he's a helper. You know, or the carpenter or the mason, they have helper. So we say, oh, it's a very low. So we are not talking about people. I I don't think we need time to help you understand that that's not what the word. By the way, just for your understanding, the word used for the helper meat is azar. And that's the same word used in describing the Holy Spirit too. Okay, just in case, in the especially Indian male, you know, dominated community and society, patriarchal society. If you think women are lesser beings, you need to remind yourself that God created them equal, absolutely equal. So there is no. As there is no inferiority in the Godhead, there is no inferiority or inequality in the relationship between a husband and a wife. Absolutely, and I think as people who are enlightened, who have their eyes open, should be the first ones to demonstrate it, to show forth it. You need to let the world know how do you see a woman as a created being of God, and that makes a huge difference. Especially, it comes as a healing to this land, especially to the land of Haryana. Yesterday, we were hearing a local Haryana boy telling us about what is the mindset in Haryana about women. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So, there's a great role that we can play in letting everybody grow. So, so that is the standard, the benchmark. Okay, anything working contrary to that, you need to understand is the image of somebody else. Whose image is selfishness? Whose image is division? Whose image is insubordination? Whose image is lust? Whose image is cheating? Whose image is it? The devil's image. So, if you see anywhere a print of that, an image of that, you need to understand this is not the regular image. This is not for what God has called you. So in your life, when you come across those sides of yours, beat it, beat it to pulp, kick it out of your house, out of your lives, because that doesn't, you were not created to be of that kind. And I'll tell you why you should believe it and work on it. Okay. So what does the, what is the mandate that he gives to men and the woman? He says, go and be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. How was he expecting us to be fruitful and multiply? How was he expecting us to be fruitful and multiply? By eating apples and bananas and oranges? How was he expecting us to be fruitful and multiply? He gave us the means to do that. He gave us the ability to do that. Above all, he gave us the sex to do that. This is God's design. Beautiful. Plan of God. Now who's talking about sex more? The porn industry? Or the church? Or the parents? Who's talking about it? On the sly, friends are teaching. Internets are being referred. I, I had a friend who called me up. He's not a Christian and somewhere he looks up to me and he said, bro, what do you do? His nine-year-old daughter, he checked his iPad, was searching for how do you make babies? A nine-year-old kid. And he says, I will be more than happy to explain to her if she comes and talks to me. But on the internet, you know what all she will get. You see, who's talking about such a beautiful thing that God ordained and created for us? The world is talking about. So this is again God's design, okay? It is a beautiful purpose and plan of God in human being for procreation, for multiplication, for growth. That is God's plan, okay? So you need to be very conscious of the scheme of the evil one. By, there is something we, call, we spoke about oneness as an image of God. 
what breaks oneness in a marriage when that exclusivity is breached isn't it yeah, isn't it yeah. that oneness is shattered yeah. that exclusivity is breached where is the oneness where is the oneness how can you understand oneness when you are not committed when you are not serious about your relationship today you necessarily need not have an affair you can have a silent affair going on i know of guys who tell me that they have been addicted to specific porn stars specific porn stars it's like their soul is wedded to them you understand what i'm trying to say you don't need to go to the physical realm now because bible is very clearly saying what is adultery in the old testament is not the definition of adultery in the new testament what does it say even if you visualize or think it's equivalent to committing adultery so the enemy is smart he knows everybody is not going to go and sleep with anybody else so let me create something which will be in his pocket all the time and i'll give him 4g now i'll give him 5g then i'll give him 7g so you don't need human relationship virtually we'll do it on the platter here it is you understand beautiful purpose and plan of god enemy wanting to violently destroy the peace the joy the happiness the everything that he has provided for us is being taken for a ride and he is having a free hand that's not the plan of god so who brought about the fall in the garden of eden who brought about the fall can i hear the answer please who oh, sorry adam somebody said adam and somebody said eve satan i heard satan also yes i came across a young man who said god did it i said i knew of three characters who could have done it or four characters who could have done it but how is god responded no no why did god create satan oh my god then that's a deep conversation that that's going nowhere <laughs> see the most beautiful thing that you and i don't realize but we really appreciate is the freedom of choice yes do you know that yes you don't realize that you go to a place where you are given no authority no permissions you can't look to the left or to the right you can't eat you can't smell you can sit down you can't stand you go to that kind of a place you'll feel like it's better that you are dead man i can eat certain non veg here i'm feeling so suffocated <laughs> just because he doesn't get something to eat that he is traditionally used to eat he feels suffocated yeah yeah now you know where his heart is <laughs> that's the thing you feel so throttled and so suffocated because you don't have the free will the freedom to make choice god in his benevolence he lavished on to us he said you choose imagine he gave all things to be appreciated and he said why on earth did he leave one acha rehta you know that also would not have been there that had to be there that had to be there so it's not the satan who prompted them to sin it's the man who decided to sin okay now there is a debate eve did it because adam also says the woman you gave me she gave me to eat and then of course eve's narration is not there he would have said this fellow when he was supposed to be protecting me he was sleeping it is his fault nobody stood up and said it's my fault adam said she and she said he and you know they were pointing fingers disaster disaster even today in fact there's a verse in the bible says in front of you 
you have the option to choose life and death. Yes. He says, choose life. Yes. You remember all, every day, tell me how many opportunities you get to make choices. So many opportunities. And either you're choosing life or you're choosing death. Just because you're not dead and in the tomb, you don't conclude that you're alive. Many dead bodies are moving around. Because the choices that make you make is what makes you whether you're alive or you're dead. You understand what I'm trying to say? You don't have to wait for your physical body to be buried. You, when you choose death after death after death, you are denying life. You're destroying what God has made available for you. A life in abundance. So every moment you have option to choose, every day you have option to choose, make the right choices. You have the option to choose and make the right choice. I was telling somebody yesterday. See, we say, oh, the Lord will help us. The Lord will protect us. The Lord will help me take the right decision. See, the Lord will help you, provided you are ready to respond. Holy Spirit is a very gentle spirit. So, you, you just shout. So, I, I'm supposed to preach, right? And in the morning, I just shout, Joshua, what are you doing? You're getting late. The Holy Spirit is going to go back. I'm telling you seriously. I got to be sensitive. I got to be sensitive that he's a gentle spirit. He's a very gentle spirit. And the devil? <laughs> he doesn't need invitations. He doesn't need, You don't have to do all that. Welcome. Take a seat. You don't have to do that. Before even you realize he's sitting and he's sleeping also. You understand? He is not like the Holy Spirit. He is the devil. He is looking for an opportunity to prey on you. He will come to steal, kill and destroy. He is a single-minded agenda man. I'm sorry, I used the word man. No. Okay, spirit. Yes. <laughs> but the fact is, you need to be conscious that you consistently have everything around you. The choices you make, the Holy Spirit that you move along with, the evil spirit that is around you. All the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. And that consciousness is going to help you become a better human being and a better person. And that goes a long way in your life. The first family, the story of the first family is not very exciting. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. The first siblings, they kill. Disaster. Disaster. You know why? The enemy knows the importance of a godly family. The enemy knows if you allow a godly family to be formed and have ground and root, many of his schemes are going to fail. Yes. So he will do anything to destroy. You know, there's a statistics in India. The maximum divorce in India is happening in the state of Kerala. And you need to know that state of Kerala has got maximum Christians. And of all the Christian, all these districts in Kerala, it happens in the district of Patanam Titta. That, that is where I am from. Okay? And if you further go down, they say it happens among Christians. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? This is not my statistics. This is the statistics available with the legal community. And I... Have, they haven't gone further. I, I sometimes feel if they go further down and try to zero down, it may not be surprising that it is among the believers. Not because believers and Christians are committed to live a wayward life. I think primarily because the enemy has targeted them and people are letting their guards down. You see, why does a star player get hurt most of the time? 
He's and why is he you know, having two players marking him all the time? Because he's a threat. You let him lose, he strikes a goal. So you, it's a strategy, boardroom strategy. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Get him covered all the time. He, you jam him, nothing moves. It's a clear strategy. This is exactly what he wants to do with godly Christian homes. He wants to destroy. So should you and I be on guard? Should I be on guard? Yes. Now I know there are a lot of people sitting here who are not married yet. And honestly this morning my message is to you guys. Because couples we already have had some time. Because the starting is now after you get married. Yes. The preparation for marriage is much before you actually actually get married. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? It may be too late by the time you get it. The reason why many of the marriages are in the shape that it is, is because people have gone into marriage without preparation. They have never thought about it. Forget about people who don't know God. I'm talking about people who know God. In India, there's a saying, you know, if the child is irresponsible, if the boy is irresponsible, get him married. He will be responsible. <laughs> this is a very common thing in India. Shadi karado, sudar jayega. Shadi, marriage is not a sudrofying machine. It will destroy somebody else's life also. You understand what I'm trying to say? So preparation for marriage or anybody getting ready for marriage is much early. That is why the aspect of being taught, to being discipled, being challenged, being advised, guided is so important. So that you can position yourself well. Because you are going to get into something which is so beautiful and so profound and so important for God that you got to go with some preparation. Yes. You know, it's like the, again, I'm running down India. I should be, because we have few foreigners here. So I better speak good about India. <laughs> you know, the cops that we have with all the big tummies, 40 inch, 38 inch tummy without practicing how to shoot or doing anything. And you expect them to protect our city? You expect them to protect our city? They can't do anything. It can only be done by somebody who is actually working out. If you sweat during peace time, you can actually accomplish during war time. If you don't do it, you are a sitting duck and many are going to be destroyed because of you. I can't just sleep because Haryana police is watching over me. You understand what I'm trying to say? Delhi police with you, for you, always. I can't believe how could they come out with that punch statement or vision statement for them? You never find them. Their car would not start. Their bikes would be, you know, flat tire bikes. The guy who is supposed to ride would be drunk. And you expect him to come and protect? This is how many people get into marriage. No idea. Get married. That's it. Shadi kyun kya? Bacha paida To produce kids. My daddy wanted grandchildren. That's why he got married. What a mission statement and a purpose statement. You understand? People, people's idea about marriage is, oh, I was getting old, so I had to get married, so I got married. Oh, achha, achha, achha. Okay. So, this is, this is the way people approach marriage and that's where it all starts going wrong. So, Adam's family, a regretful family. It came to an extent that sin was rampant. Sin was rampant. And it is so sad. Actually, it is so sad. I don't even want to speak about it. Because it, it hurts me bad. There's a verse in the Bible which says, God regretting creating man. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? How many of you don't know this exists in the Bible? I'll tell you the words. There, there's nothing wrong in if you guys not knowing. If you don't know, please raise your hands. I'll tell you the words. Yeah. So somebody help me with that. that that's important because you should not go back thinking that it's uh, Noah's story just before Noah. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Please make a note. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. Okay, yes, it is. Yeah. 
He says, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. Is it six or seven? Six. 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 Seven. The Lord was sorry. Okay, no problem. I, I, mean, I have an extra verse in my Bible. But what I'm saying is, imagine, imagine, imagine the Creator God looking at His creation, the most beautiful masterpiece of His. And He's like, I, I, I just regret creating them. Sometimes, some, sometimes, many parents in their hurt, some of them are stupid. But some of them out of hurt have felt in their heart or have even said this, verbalized this. I regret giving birth to you. Because in all probability, the kids would have been a pain for them. I'm not uh, validating or advocating or appreciating what they do. But I'm just saying, God did it. God did it. That's the extent to which mankind rebelled against God. And he had to clean it up. He had to clean it up. So he, uh, he uh, sends a flood and the world, you know, Noah and his family is left. Okay, so again, a family is chosen. Okay, Noah alone. Is not the one who's chosen. A family, again portraying the fact that family is important for God. Family is important for God. Noah and his family were saved. But again, a chapter down the line, man becomes rebellious. But by now, God had already, you know, made a covenant with man. Because he said, of course, this is too painful. Within no time, man again rebelled. This Noah's descendants rebelled. Can you believe this? They would have been told the story how God would have kept them. When everything around them perished. Everything around them perished. But just few generations. I don't know exactly how many gener generations. But just few generations down the line. Or maybe the same generation or the next generation. They forgot. And they rebelled. And they said, let us make something for ourselves. And we will tell him that, you know, we will be a people of big name. He said, scatter them. He couldn't kill them anymore. He said, Again, a family losing the vision and the purpose, right? Maybe Noah managed it well, but by the time the next generation came, it was gone. His purpose is through a family getting defeated again. His intent to redeem this world. His mission was to redeem what he had created. But nobody was getting ready for that. Genesis chapter 12. Out of the blue. From nowhere. For no reason. For no legacy connect. No line or reason for this gentleman to be chosen. Mr. Abraham is picked up. Actually, he was an idol maker. And you will see further down, he says, Thou shall not have an idol in your life. It's a commandment. And he chooses a guy who was actually an idol maker. And he says, Come, I will take you. And there also, very beautifully, you know, what you see, he says, Leave your people and your country and come. I thank God that God enlightened Abraham without specifically mentioning that this invitation is for Mr. and Mrs. Abraham. When he said Abraham, Abraham understood that this was also for my wife. Many times, if you don't invite the wife, the wife doesn't go, right? Hey, yeah, invitation is only for you. I will not come. Many marriages, there is a big argument. They, you only matter for them. 
Even God also, you only matter. I will stay here. I will suffer. I will, I am, a, you know, I, all negative things. But thank God, Abraham had the uh, understanding. And Sarah, a great example, just went along. And that man in the Bible is shown to be the one God starts using to further his purpose. Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and you know, it's a story beautifully, um, uh, you know, evolving. But very soon, they also lose the plot. Now, God had to do something very different. So, what does he do? One of the family volunteers or is assigned to go and do what man can't do. He says, let's go down and tell these guys that, you guys, you, you can't do it. So the only way you can do is through me, with me, by my grace. So I will facilitate it. I'll pay the ultimate price. I will get onto the cross and I will die for you. I will die for your redemption. I will die for your reconciliation. I will die for your healing. I will die to facilitate oneness. I will die to ensure that you are not selfish anymore. I will die. I will take it over me so that you can have it easy. So he makes the ultimate sacrifice. Beautifully positioning and helping us to stand. Now, you and I are, most of us sitting here are believers. People who have accepted Jesus into their life and have recognized what happened on the cross. We have the Holy Spirit helping us to lead an effective, uh, functional, successful life. But still, we are struggling. I'm okay if you're still struggling and trying to work it out. Many have even given up. It is impossible for this man to change. This is impossible for this woman to change. My kids are a lost case. They will never change. He will never change. She will never change. This is all what you get to hear uh, in, in homes which are suffering and hurting. People have given up on each other. They the cross is there. In some homes, literally, literally, this cross is hanging. And some have even Jesus on it. But the effectiveness of cross is not evident. Rebellious, isn't it? What do you call that? Rebellion? Rebellion? You call that rebellion, isn't it? Man still wants to rebel. Rebellion is in his blood. He is not ready to appropriate what Christ has accomplished for him on the cross. The cross nullifies the effect of the fall. It is a life-changing reality. It is a life-changing reality. Please understand that if you believe what happened on the cross, it nullifies the curse. You are no more under curse. It's a life-changing reality. It is a life-changing reality. I said this thing earlier, yesterday when we were there. I, there were people who looked into my eyes and said, you should never get married. They said, you're going to be a horrible husband. They said, you cannot be faithful to anybody. They told me all this thing and I believed it. I believed it. I believed it. But the Lord touched me. And the Lord turned my life upside down. Okay? And I got married when I was 25. People are struggling even when they are 30 and 32 and 35 because they are still thinking that they are not ready for marriage. I'm not talking about those who are ready but things have not happened. But some are still not ready for marriage. Are abhi MD khatam karenge. We have to finish my MD first and then my DM first. Settle all and some say I have to buy a house first. Sir, car nahi hai to shadi kaise How will I get married if I don't have a car? Are Baba, car is secondary. 
Get married when it is time and the Lord is telling you to get married. You're, are you getting people? People find reasons. Marriage is the last option for many educated young folks. The last thing. That's in the agenda list is the last thing. And for many it becomes too late also. By the time they are ready, it may be too late. They don't, they don't find people of their age or whatever. So marriage is God's design and you need to commit yourself to understand that. Okay. Now, primarily, quickly on the on the people who are who form this family: husband, wife, children. This is family. My family. If I am to tell you my family, it comprises of my beautiful wife and my two boys who are sitting there and my girl who is in the hostel today. Yes, that's my family. That comprises of me, isn't it? The primary unit that forms that family is me and my wife. But for many, me, wife, ke beech mein, children take, come in. For many, career comes in. They think if I have career, I can have a wife. They think if I have a um, child, I can have a husband. Many, like I told you, many look for a husband to have a child. Many look for a wife to have a child. So, child becomes the center for everything. But the primary unit is the husband and the wife. And God wants them to form their home with that understanding so that He is able to establish and fulfill His purposes. Now, a little about the husband, the men folk. What does the Bible say about them? What are, who are they supposed to be? Husband, who is he supposed to be in the house? What does the Bible say? Ephesians chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 3, this is where there is a mention of uh, the husband and wife. What is the husband's expectation? To be the head of the house. You know, if I stand up and say, I am the head of my house and I have my wife's permission to say that. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? I don't need my wife's permission. It is not a designation or a star given to me by my wife. It is not anybody else who decides. It is God ordained, God decided position for me. You understand what I am trying to say? Bible says so. Christ is the head of the church. church. Right? Husband is the head of the house. There is a battle. Big fight over it. You know, the whole idea of feminism is born out of this fight to fight and take it. They have enough reasons. Many ladies have enough valid reasons. I am not at all contesting some of their thoughts. Because see, this leader can only be of two kinds. Either he can be a good leader or a bad leader. A good leader attracts. A good leader encourages. A good leader inspires. Yes or no? Yes. And a bad leader? Opposite. Discourages depresses you, creates pain for you. So, man is supposed to position himself as a leader. Today, I don't know, maybe because of the adulterated food that we eat, many men are behaving like women. I'm not looking down on women, by the way, okay? Yesterday, I think we cleared it. Women seemingly are more stronger than men according to me. I was, uh, and one of my simple basic uh, understanding is the population issue in this world would have been solved if men were asked to, you know, produce children. They would have refused to go beyond a child or a two. You understand what I'm trying to say? It has to take a very strong woman to actually go through the whole idea of pregnancy. So, and emotionally, are they weak? They're very strong. 
So I'm not saying woman is weak. But what I'm saying is men are now looking more like women. They dress like women. They talk like women. They walk like women. They do that. They like it. How am I looking? <laughs> Colors. Pink used to be identified as something girls would love. Now girls don't like pink. I buy something pink for my daughter. Hey, I want this. Daddy, what color you pick? I said, I thought girls like pink. Daddy, all girls don't like pink. It's gone. Boys like pink. <laughs> Yellow. You know, colorful. I'm not saying, I'm not saying. What I'm saying is, me, the other day there was an argument somewhere. There was an argument over parking or something. And there was an aggressive argument going on. And, uh, you know, to, to the extent that it could have been violent. And the wife was pushed in the front and she was doing the talking and the husband was standing behind her. And, <laughs> and she was... Ah, ah, yeah, ah, ah, ah. It's happening. It, has, it is happening. Many don't want to work. Wife has got a well-paying job. Kagarma. I, I can say this here because there are less Malayalis here. In this church, I can say this. You see, Malayalis, especially, I'm a Malayali, so I can pick on Malayalis, okay? They like marrying nurses. You know, most of the girls in Kerala go for nursing for, not, for multiple reasons. One is they'll easily get a job and they will, probability of they going to the Gulf is high. They make more money. And UK, US and all. But the hidden fact also is that they will not be left without finding a boy. Somebody will come and marry you. Because it's a hot property. She makes good money. She is good. You understand what I'm saying? They're happy. So there is a play. I, I'm just looking. I hope we don't have any Malayali here who will throw stones at me. There is a place, uh, you know, where... Um, uh, Ayurvigyan Nagar, where all the aims, uh, you know, nurses stay. It's a joke. The poor woman gets up early morning, cooks for the whole day or whatever, packs for the kids and all. These men are sleeping. And then they get up and they go to play badminton. Till 10 o'clock they are playing badminton. And then they will sit across, do nothing. And then... By the time the woman is coming, they will rush to the house, warm the food, feed her, and then again they are sleeping. Most of them don't want to work. I'm not exaggerating. Most of them don't want to work. They're happy with their wives working. And then, Malayali male chauvinism is at a different level. He's like, no way he's going to let her ever rule or have any commanding position in the house. So he will do zero contribution, but he'll still want to be the king in the house. It's not working. It is not working. It cannot happen. So man has to behave like a man. He has to step up as a man. He has to take responsibility as a man. Bible talks about man's role. Foremost role that I see about a man is he's a leader. And what's the kind of leader that the Bible talks about? Jesus is a servant leader. Leader not sitting and making rules. You go there, you sit here, you can't send that much money to your mom, you can't do this, you can't buy this, you can't do this, you can't do this. You can't keep doing this thing all the time. You got to come down to serve. Jesus came to serve. I think... Many of our believer boys, after knowing this truth, don't want to be leaders. Because it's not easy for them to serve. They are happy about everything else, but no question of serving. So, boys are trained. Moms can get upset if, you know, boys are asked to work in the kitchen. Or do some errands for the home. I was telling them, my mom, I make some... Great mutton curry and you can come and have it in my house when I prepare. So when my mom and dad were at home, I got into the kitchen 
and I make, my kids and my wife said, Acha, you have to make, you have to make, you have to make. I said, okay, I'll make. I go to the kitchen, I make some great mutton curry. So my dad comes, he enjoys, he said, wow, awesome, fantastic, fantastic. Everybody saying, daddy, ah, boy, fantastic. My mom, <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong with her? And she's not even eating anything. I thought maybe her stomach is upset or something wrong. So next time again I make, again the same story. She's serious, very serious, both Gambhir. And I'm like, what's wrong? Now I figured out, oh, mommy is upset that her son has been asked to get into the kitchen to cook. You see, mind you, my mom is a modern lady. Eh? You see her, you guys are going to run because she is pretty smart. But inside her, she still has that mummy who does not want her boy to be involved in all petty, petty things. This is Chota Kam. And I, you know what is the errand that I like the most in my house? Washing dishes. Oh, that's the last thing my mom can see. She does not even come to that side. <laughs> Boys can't do these things. So, when a woman needs her husband to step in, he's never been trained. He does not know. He's always eaten outside. He's always had people to help. So, what is he getting room for? Disaster. Because when you get into marriage, you got to be a leader who's serving and leading and ensuring that he gets that respect that is needed. Nurturing. Bible actually does not tell the wife that, you know, you have to present him as Christ presented uh, the church. He tells the husband that love your wife and work with her in a manner that as Christ presented the church without blemish, you will help her. Now, how can you do that? Without having the moral credibility, the mental credibility, the spiritual credibility to lead. How can you do that? You can't do that. You just can't do that. So what happens? She usurps the position, the leadership. There is a fight over it. So why is this young man not able to do it? Because he's never habitual of reading the Bible or getting into any spiritual activity to understand. Forget about all this thing. He does not have a relationship with God. So when he doesn't have a relationship with God, he struggles. And he struggles. And you know what men do when they struggle? They don't own it up. They hide. They find reasons to find an excuse. They push it. They don't take it up. So, so this young man is not setting him up properly for a beautiful marriage. Because he's not investing to prepare himself. So if you have to nurture, if you have to protect, you, if you have to provide, you have to do things which will be conducive for you to position as a good husband. You understand? Even if you are a, a professional of any kind, in your house, you are just a husband, by the way. I am the CEO of my company. 600 people are working for me. Who cares? Who cares? Wash the dishes, if needed. <laughs> If needed, okay, you heard that, okay? If needed, okay? <laughs> I'm not telling that every day the man should be watching. Then there's a problem also. Okay, by the way, girls, I'm coming to you. <laughs> but if there is a need, he has to step in. The leader takes that position which is most required, okay? He doesn't put anybody else there. If there is a need, he steps in and he gets the job done, okay? He has to take responsibility. You have to take responsibility. If you are not in the habit of taking responsibility, what do you do? What do you do? Simple thing. Huh? Give responsibility. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. You see, the other day uh, I was reading somewhere. You know, this is a tendency. A child uh, playing around by mistake. Uh, drops a glass or a glass table and it breaks. How many times do you think the child finds it comfortable to say, I'm sorry, I did it. By mistake, I did it. He will find out and says, I don't know how it fell. <laughs> Normal tendency, I don't know how it fell. It just fell. 
I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. So he's grown up all the while giving excuses and never taking responsibility. So I was telling yesterday, these men are also grown up children. So even at this age, they are not taking responsibility. They are not a, not my mistake. Oh, sir, your son, I saw him in the hookah bar. My wife is not teaching them Bible. Eh? Sorry? I told them they should not go, but my wife is spoiling. My wife is giving them the money. My wife is doing this. My wife is doing that. Not taking responsibility. Not taking responsibility. Shying away. Not ready to say, okay, I'm sorry. I think I need to get in. I need to work with my boys. I need to work with my daughter. Responsibility. Shying away from responsibility. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. Try to address it before things happen. And own it up. Step up. Stand. Be a man. Be a man. You know, everybody can be born with a male organ, necessarily may not be a man. I'm sorry, it's a harsh statement that I'm making. If you want to be a man of God's kind, you got to work and have some character around you. Some character around you. And you have to receive that strength from the Lord and position yourself. So I'm not telling you to be intimidated about marriage. You were wired to be married. It is, a, it is not fair for you to remain unmarried for long. You should get married. Marriage should be a priority for you. Biologically, you are not wired to stay separately or without marriage. It's a lie people say that they can handle without marriage until unless they have a call or the feelings the kind that Paul had. But I'm just telling you. So consider it as a priority in your priority list. Plan it as young kids. Plan it. I keep telling them. You, I, I, my constant conversation to my children is, buddy, when I tell you to work hard, it is not that I am seeing you as a teak tree that in the old days I will cut it and I will sell it and I will survive. Okay, many Indians are bringing up children with this understanding that they will take care of us when they are old. They will provide for us when they are old. And many, many are just looking up to them and manipulating them. Manipulating them to continue to receive from them. And, and they are not, and it's not a godly way. Bible actually says a righteous will leave legacy for his generations. I don't, I never see anywhere Bible saying provide food for the, take care, honor your parents is there. So many parents are now casual in their approach, in their life. Men are positioning themselves. Okay, now if I have a daughter and a son, he will provide for me. He will take care of my, and they are manipulating and manipulating. and manipulating. I keep telling many of them. Hey, Baba, when you were producing a child, if you would have put some trees, you could have used that in the rubber plantation. Why on earth? That man was created to get married to another woman and start a life of his own. That's priority number one for you. And then comes the rest of the things. He has a generation to take forward. So parents are irresponsibly positioning themselves, not preparing to have a retirement and putting their dependence on their children. Ridiculously wrong. Not correct. You know, I was reading the other day, one of the blessings that uh, Jacob speaks over one of his son, Benjamin. He, this is what the Bible says. Benjamin, you are like a ravenous wolf who goes out in the morning for the prey and in the evening distributes it. It's like a young man, you go work hard. And, 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 and be focused and, and be having sufficient that you can come and distribute it with your generations. Young men, slow fee, not wanting to work hard, not wanting to position yourself, not wanting to be diligent in what you're doing. I keep telling my kids, you don't have to worry about us. If you want your generations to have a better life and a better future, you got to work hard now. Daddy and mommy don't need your money. But your children will either respect you or disrespect you if you have been sloppy at this age. Because how you position now is what determines where you're going in your life. Be excited about your role, boss. This is God-given role and this is a powerful role. And God wants us to be leaders in the house and take things forward and bless 
lives. Okay, Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 3 talks about the role of a husband and a wife. Okay, so a head like Christ, Christ is forgiving. He is loving. Men hold grudges. Men who are not able to forgive, contrary to the image of Christ. How much do you forgive? How much should I forgive somebody? Bible says, seven times, seventy. In other words, keep on forgiving. If you find it difficult or if you are good in maths and you found the numbers, don't get stuck to that. Forgive as Christ forgives the church. So that is beyond seven times seventy, isn't it? Forgive as Christ forgives. Forgive. If as men, if you're not ready to forgive, you have a problem. Anger. Sorry, quickly I want to address that. Anger. Many angry young men. You know, they say empty vessel, make more noise. noise. Many of the guys who are angry are actually hollow guys. This is a strategy of distraction. See, anger in itself is not wrong. Okay? Anger is, a little bit of anger is good. Bible says, but do not sin in your anger. Anger is a positive energy. Because if you see something wrong, you better be angry and let people know that this is wrong. But don't sin in your anger is what the Bible says. Money is not bad. But the lust for money is bad. So we believers sometimes, you know, we say, oh, I cannot say anything. I, how can I correct them? How can I? Are Baba, you don't understand. You have to correct. And you have to bring in emotions. And anger in itself is not wrong. If you have to correct your kid, you got to correct your kid. No problem. So harsh, so brutal, so painful. No, brother, how can I hit my kid? The Western world is suffering because they seemingly have cracked it, saying that we will have a law which forbids children being spanked. We are on the way. I think already schools have already announced this in India now. But correction in love is 100% mandatory for a person to be moved to the right direction. It's a biblical principle. So anger in itself is not right. But angry people getting into marriage, what do they do? They ruin their marriage. They ruin their marriage. Have you seen people throwing plates? Kicking on the fridge refrigerators? <laughs> Have you seen people doing that? They will destroy their own stuff in anger. They will do anything to actually let the other person know that they are angry. Not a good sign. You got to understand that you cannot sin in anger. Okay? Do not sin in anger. Okay. What about the ladies? Wives, what comes to your mind? Why was she created? What is her role? What is, what was, what is the command to the wife? What is her primary role? Submissive. Submission is what comes first. Very correct, she said. But actually, if you look at the Bible, she was created for companionship. You, you see the origin. She was created for companionship. But then the sin came. And the consequence of sin was what? That she will try to rule over him. So when she will try to rule over you, to put her in the right place, what do you have to do? Bible says, he will use force and he will dominate. When God created man and woman, he said, Dominate everything. Bring under dominion everything. But he didn't say bring dom uh, dominion over the husband and wife. He never, he, he didn't allow you to dominate your wife or your husband. But the sin immediately turned it around. The wife wanted to dominate and the man said, I will use brutal force to dominate him. But the cross. What happens on the cross? Cross is not just a theological fact. It's a life-changing reality. Cross changes things. So wife is a companion first. Who's a companion? A friend. Wife, yes. A friend. A counselor. A comforter. Companion. Companion. And most of the time, what are 
this wonderful wife doing? I like watching football. I want my wife to sit with me. Hey, waste of time. What is this? This boys, kids is happening. You are watching football. This is it. Change the channel. Change the channel. Change the channel. Okay. Change the channel. I'm like, today I struck a deal and we signed a new account. Joshua is not studying. Joshua is not doing this. Joshua is wasting his time. He's always on the mobile. I'm like, oh my God. Hello, my friend. At least appreciate that we got a new sign, the account. Or she, you, uh, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? Because she, she doesn't care to be a companion. Rather, she or a friend. Joshua's feedback has to come. I'm not saying her, I'm, so I'm just addressing the companion part. A friend, a companion. Okay, when I'm picking my wife, don't think that things are that bad in our house. I can't pick any, any other lady, so I'm just talking about my wife, okay? But what I'm saying is we have had our own struggles, okay? We have had our own struggles. So I need her to sit with me. I need her to do something that I like with me. I like her to talk to me, ask me how was my day. I like her to talk to me about my fears. I like to, her to talk, inquire about my health. I like that. I remember always, man is a child in a big body. He still needs companion. He still needs friend. Uncle Malik needs a companion. Yes or no, uncle? Yes. He's got grandchildren. He's a senior citizen, but still he needs a companion. A companion. We, we, we had a song running in our conference. I want to grow old with you. A song. It's a beautiful cartoon film song we were listening. You got to do something right when you're young if you want to grow old uh, together. You can't just grow old just like that. I'll tell you, kids will fly away. Looking at the lifespan today, the health condition today, on an average, 30 to 35 years, you're going to be only two together. Only the old man and the old girl. And if you are not having a quality relationship, you don't have to wait to go to hell. <laughs> hell will be around you. <laughs> I'm telling you. And who is the creator of that hell? Who's investing in that hell? We. Both the, Both the parties. So as a woman, your primary first role always remind yourself. Yes, you are their wife. Uh, you are supposed to be some. I'm talking. I will talk about submission, but companion first, a friend first, a companion first, a comforter first, a comforter first. Remember, whatever you, you see at that time, you uh, many of the girls get proud, feel proud when you say, "Oh, the word used is other. That's Holy Spirit, and you are the same." Oh, wow! But then when you tell them what is Holy Spirit, and how does it work, what's its character? Then you say, oh, I'm supposed to be a comforter, a companion, a caregiver. Oh, my God. Counselor. Oh, I didn't realize all these things. You understand what I'm trying to say? So how do you just get into marriage and you become a comforter, companion? First experience the Holy Spirit in your life before you get married. See how the Holy Spirit is working in your life today. Experience the pleasure of having the Holy Spirit to take care of you and to comfort you, to challenge you, to encourage you, to build you up. You see that? What you see is what you give. What you receive is what you give. So when you're young, if you're not, if you're running away from the Holy Spirit, doing everything that does not get you to be aligned with the Holy Spirit, how do you know what is the character of the Holy Spirit? You can't go to a school and learn all this thing. You've got to practice it. You've got to experience it. The power of the Holy Ghost is not limited to in speaking in tongues alone. Experience it in your life. Practice it in your life. And then share it back. What you receive freely is what you give freely. Men who don't receive love from God can't give love. And the reason why many of them are not loving their spouse is because they have not received the love of God. They are religious. Men and women are religious. They are attending all the church services. They are doing everything. They are paying the tithe. But they have no relationship with Christ. Therefore, they don't understand both these aspects. So what happens? Marriage becomes a drudgery, a disaster. A beautiful plan of God. A beautiful plan of God. Position yourself. 
love men love women learn to submit submit submission is not you know a sign of weakness do you know who can submit only a man with strength or a woman with strength can submit everybody cannot submit to everybody you have to have character to submit you will not submit otherwise why why do you think um, powerful people's children violate the rules uh, most because they don't want to submit and they get behind the bar they don't want to submit so submission in itself is not a bad word submission is a very healthy word you know meek meek it's again a gift being meek meekness is a gift it's a beautiful trait meekness is not a sign of weakness it is strength in control strength in control when you have all the power to harm that person and when you are holding yourself back it shows that you have character in my house if supposing i am going violent i am upset about something i am throwing tantrums i am doing everything how on earth things will get resolved if my decibel level is at 10 and she is trying to talk to me at 10 if she is her response is at 10 how will that issue be ever resolved now if my decibel is at 10 and if she is talking to me at 1 or 2 or 3 how long can i continue how long will i continue and i play the reverse role when she can lose it and if i just hold on but what do we learn are bhaiya when i went in india especially in northern part of india when two cars hit even if you are the one who's mistake made the mistake you are trained that get out and be aggressive kya karta kya karta karte because if you are timid they will the other guy will set on you so he's trained like that just shout at the other person the first guy who gets to shout seemingly gets the edge it doesn't work like that it doesn't work like that so one party has to take the call to build the family we can sort it out so you can, anybody can lose it at any given point of time but if both are deciding to destroy the house it's very difficult for anybody to build it back so understand bring in those aspect of submission also i want to say submission is for each other okay i will say submit to each other so i hear lady saying okay i can submission is if my husband does jesus role it is easy for me to submit i wish you never were married because you are throwing away the element of grace you are removing a place for grace to be operational you yourself want grace but you don't want to share the grace with your husband that is not fair you know you are at fault and you are happy to appropriate grace but when it comes to your husband to stand in grace you kill him you hit him where it hurts you like this you like that you always do this you preaching big time in the house you are zero <laughs> you counseling many couples in the house you are no your children no how will i stand and talk how can i stand and preach how can i t- but that doesn't mean that i'm a prophet she is moving in grace which facilitates me to stand even as i'm working to improve my relationship with my family you understand what i'm tra- we have to be graceful to each other yes. we have to be graceful to each other and share it and and transact it beautifully because without grace we cannot do anything without him we can do nothing so when it comes to ourselves we want to ha- experience grace but when when we want our partner to be standing under grace we say remove grace we will be legalistic you did this you did that you did it. you all ladies also have a habit of it you always forget this thing are baba you never give me a gift are just last day i gave you a gift so generalized statement it is only hurting it's not taking you anywhere be specific you forgot my birthday this year <laughs> or you forgot to take me out on a date this week you never you always forget coming in time you always forget my birthdays you know always never these are all statements that you get to hear and that only aggravates the relationship and, and men you know i i are actually 
incomplete without their wives. I, honestly, I'm telling you. How many, I doubt, eh, how many men here remember dates? Except now that we have tools, we may still remember dates because you have a pop up that says birthday of Alana, how birthday, Fatabu Bishkur, Fatabu Bishkur. What's it? Men need help. Women are complicated and they make it complicated further. They want man to figure out what's going on in our head. Oh my God, what's happening? Tell them what you want. I feel, give me some love. Okay, I'll give you love. You understand what I'm saying? Buy me something. Buy me a rose. Okay, I'll get you a rose. Because the other day when I got rose, she said, why are you wasting money? <laughs> now, 10 days later, she has a mood swing. She is waiting for a rose. Now, how do I know you changed? <laughs> you help me. I will buy not one rose. I will buy 10 roses for you, baby. But you tell me. Don't complicate the whole thing. Help each other. Help each other. Help each other. That goes a long way when you're, you know, very, very, very carefully, purposefully helping each other. Men have a lot of things in their head. They want their wives to respond like this, but they're scared to tell them. They think they will understand. They will never understand. Tell them what you want, what you like. What do you appreciate? Maybe that will be, the, they may not respond immediately, but it will be in the back of their mind. And if you love them enough, they may just respond also. But just don't sit there and just have imagination that she will change. Talk, make it easy for each other. Make it easy for each other. I love, I would want to eat fish curry. Okay? I want to eat fish curry. I sit, I'm sitting there and thinking that she will make, you, ne you never made fish curry. You never. Hare Baba, just buy fish and bring it and tell her, she will make it. I love the fish curry my wife makes. Now, if I buy fish, doesn't it make it easy for her to get make fish for me? So, we need to help each other. Help each other in improving and having a blessed, beautiful life. Don't waste it. I keep telling my wife, both of us say this. Every day, every moment, every hour wasted arguing is in the dustbin. It's gone, boss. I lost it. It's such a beautiful relationship. It's such a beautiful relationship. I, I would have been, I told, you know, guys who know me, I would have been a disaster of an of a absolute different kind. God gave me a suitable partner. She stood along with me. She had struggles. We had struggles. But we allowed the Holy Spirit to shape us. You know, we allowed the Holy Spirit. We were open. If you ask us, what was your secret or what is it? We were open for correction. We were open for the Holy Spirit to change us, transform us. The Holy Spirit is the best trainer and the best teacher along with us, helping us. So we will, today by God's grace, to a large extent we understand each other. Large extent we understand each other. I, 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 I picked up a hobby of going out for biking trips. Initially she had big struggles. I'm like a moron, I would just plan my trip and I would just go. And she would be sitting at home. And a time came when she was taken to the hospital also because she was worried, she was concerned, she has fear in her mind and then she also had this fear that I was with all these wild boys and what is this my man doing with these wild boys out there. All those things were playing in her mind and then eventually I heard that she was taken to the hospital. That's the way that she was being tormented by my choice of a hobby. So what was I supposed to do? Quit biking. I'm a fool to do that. I'm not a fool to do that. I sat down. We communicated. We spoke. Made her understand why I do what. Brought down the frequency of the number of rides. Planned my calendar in advance. Now she's happy. I'm happy. When I'm riding, I'm more excited because I don't have a wife brooding and sitting in the God will teach you. You will fall down one day. <laughs> then you will understand. <laughs> You understand what I'm trying to say? Get them along with you. Get them along with you and go about doing it. He came to give you life. Life in abundance. It's not possible for you to have life in abundance if you not, do not learn to take people along with you. If you learn people to take, take your spouse along with you, it goes along with children. Very important. You have a limited window period with them. Okay? We have a very limited. I have only few 
months now with my boys in the city. I look back and I regret. I'm telling you, you're sitting here. I regret. I could have done it better. Many people look at us and say, you have done a great job, but I know I could have done it better. And I'm, stand, I'm saying this out of regret. Out of regret. But I'm sure God has already worked in his life and we have had some beautiful engagements. I don't want to do that to my younger one now. I want to use my time more with him. Many of you have young kids. Many of you don't have kids. You are not even married. Don't waste time. The day, moment you have a baby, a child in your lap, visualize what you want to do. Have a vision, have a dream. How you want? Not about making them engineer and doctor. Okay? <laughs> whatever is their calling, let them go and become whatever they want to become. But as a father, son, as a father, mother, daughter, father, daughter, do what best you can do. Make them strong individuals, you know, followers of Jesus Christ, practicing Christian, not the religious kind. You understand what I'm trying to say? My boy, when he comes to church, he gets his hair down like this. And when he goes to school, he gets his hair up like this. I say, boy, you come down like, don't have to do this. Come the way you go to school, no problem. We don't have, we don't have two sides. We have only one side. You like it or you don't like it. So if I have anything that is not acceptable, you have anything that is not acceptable, we'll work. We don't have to play church. We've got to play life, man, and a life in abundance. You understand what I'm trying? I came back and I, you know, I went on a biking trip. I came back. I'll just share this and I'll close this. I came back and the, on this trip, the last trip that I made, I had a fall uh, while I was crossing a water, water crossing. And it was caught on camera <coughs> by one of my friends. The first thing that I did was when I came back, instead of showing him some of the difficult terrains that I crossed, I showed him, showed, showed my boys the fall that I had. And we laughed and we, you know, because it was not an injurious one and <coughs> we picked the bike and we went on. My boy did a trip to Bhutan recently. And when he came back, before he was talking about anything else, he was talking about the fall that he met. And he was saying it was dark and nobody was there and the bike fell and I was under the bike. See, he didn't feel uncomfortable to talk about his failure. <coughs> because his father was ready to talk about his vulnerability. So there is a preparation that you can do when you bring up your children that they learn to be open and transparent and they can handle things better in life. Many of our young kids are trying to solve their own problem and they are only going in circle and they're going down. So if you give them that freedom to come and talk to you, share with you about their successes and weaknesses and failures, you stand along with them, you help them and you guide them. On earth, you and I have a mission. And that's not your personal mission. The mission that God had, it is to glorify Him and show forth Him and engage in the redemption of mankind. Right. And that is only possible if everybody in the house is engaged in this and is committed in this and has a purpose. And when we have that purpose, we will surely stand with Him and we will see, surely see kingdoms being touched and lives being blessed and many being added to Him. So young men, boys and girls, married and unmarried, everybody sitting here. Please commit yourself with this understanding that God has got a great plan for you. Don't find the most beautiful woman. If my wife would have gone for my hair, by now she would have been somewhere else. And if I would have gone for her waist, by now I would have been worried. So it doesn't last. Don't stick to the temporal things. Stick to what is divine. What is the purpose of God and work towards it, which is beautiful. And when you work towards it, you will see you walking along with God and God fulfilling in His purpose. And there is no greater privilege than to know, like Joshua said, I and my family will serve the Lord. I, because around him, everybody was going everywhere. And he said, I and my family will serve the Lord. God bless you. Let's pray.